Welcome to the SBI Podcast, offering CEOs, sales and marketing leaders ideas to make the number. Welcome SBI Podcast listeners and video podcast viewers. My name is Andrew Urtiaga, and with my co-host Drew Karen, we're principals at SBI, a sales and marketing consultancy dedicated to helping you make your number. This is a weekly SBI podcast, and its purpose is to share insights and information relevant to your business. Before we get started, an interesting fact about myself and my co-hosts, besides having the same first names, we both hold black belts in the martial arts. I have over 17 years martial arts experience, and Drew Karen has 27 years. What this means to you is if we can't agree on a topic, we're going to sell it, settle it in a cage fight on SBI TV. Yeah, I think that would work out well for the viewers. Probably work out well for me, too. <laughs> so you think people want to watch us fight for 30 minutes or actually talk about sales and marketing and strategic alignment? I honestly think it's both. <laughs> so today's show, we're going to be reviewing one of my favorite books of 2015, The Challenger Customer, co-authored by Brent Adamson, Matthew Dixon, Pat Spencer, and Nick Tomain. The book's the sequel to the very successful Challenger sales, but this time around, the focus is on the consensus purchasing dynamics. The number and diversity of stakeholders involved in purchases is increasing, and those parties are failing to arrive at the kind of consensus early on in the purchase to give suppliers any chance of winning high-quality deals. Yeah, the implication of these findings have a ripple effect throughout the organization, and we can probably spend a lot of time talking about that, and we'll start with the sales organization. Here's a quote from the book that I, I, uh, I pulled out, Drew, that I really liked, and I think it's going to resonate with a lot of heads of sales and marketing uh, listeners out there. This is from a head of sales and marketing leader at a global industrial fragrances company, and I quote, I just don't understand. We are the leading supplier in our industry. Our products are world-class, our brand second to none, and our salespeople are highly skilled. There's not a single deal in our industry where we are not invited to participate. We make it to the table every time. And then in the book, he goes on to say, we ended up competing on price every single time. We're always one of three suppliers. The issue of consistent buying is causing a downward pressure on deal size, margin, and growth. So really what this is saying, and I hear a lot from my clients, is that every deal is a competitive slugfest. Right. Yeah, and I've seen it play out too often, right? We're competing on price because they're not seeing any other differentiation, right? So I think it's going to resonate well with our listeners when they think about that too. But too often what I hear is the fix is sales training, right? In fact, I had the quote from one of the sales VPs, and he said, if I can just equip my sales force with these newfound skills, I can differentiate my seller from the competition and thus win more deals at a higher deal size and higher margins, right? So when you think about that in its most simplistic terms, I don't disagree with it too, but yeah. it's definitely not the answer. Yeah, so what, is, so what do you think you mean by that? <clears throat> well, that's really putting a Band-Aid on an old problem, right? And it's really trying to attack a strategic problem with a tactic, right? So mm -hmm. <clears throat> a good example would be to start off at first and say, okay, what's the difference between tactics and strategy, right? So strategy is actually doing the right things, right? When you look at tactics, tactics is actually doing things right. So if we can put up the graphic for the audience, what I like to show them is the two by two grid. So if we look at the two by two grid, you have a strategy across the top axis, and then you have tactics across the vertical axis, right? So for strategy, you're either gonna be effective or ineffective in the way you execute it. Right. For tactics, you're gonna be efficient or inefficient. So if you're looking at that too, if you are very efficient at executing your tactics, but your strategy is bad, you're gonna die quickly, right? right? Now, that same thing, if you have a bad strategy, but you execute very inefficiently, you're going to die slowly, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if your strategy is good and you can execute still inefficiently, you'll get in that survive mode, right? right but right. where our listeners want to be is in the top right quadrant. And what that is, is the thrive category. So that's where you have a brilliant plan that's executed brilliantly. Yeah. So in other words, training, training really, if, what I took away from this book is the pitfall here is if if you extract the concept of the purchasing dynamics and the changes of occurring and really the concept of too many chefs putting their hands in the pot, mm -hmm. 
is that you can pull from here uh, the fact that you think your people need more training. And that's tactical. Right. Right. That doesn't really solve the problem, as you mentioned earlier. And then I think what compounds the problem is you could be pursuing, call it this buying decision team, but you could be pursuing the buying decision team with the wrong products, with the, uh, with the wrong poor leads. Right. So you really got to look at the entire ecosystem, which I think we're going to touch a little bit later uh, in the podcast. The other thing here is that even when it comes to training, I think a lot of organizations rely on this as a check the box. If you think about SKOs, there's training events. Right. And this event-based training costs a lot of money, thousands and thousands of dollars. It, it takes a, a lot of resources out of the field, so you're, you're missing a lot of opportunities and at-bats. It takes a lot of man hours to put it all together. So think about the cost, you know, the people, the time, the money, the resources that it takes. And anywhere you look on the internet, you see the statistics when it comes to training that, what is it, like five days after the event, people have forgotten 80 to 90% of what they actually consumed. And 2% say they've never even been to it. And 2% can't even remember. Those are the people that have been at the bar a little bit too long. But, you know, my other point there is you, you equip them with these ideas and these concepts, and then there's no reinforcement afterwards. There's no coaching. There's no help in the implementation. I mean, people are going to struggle to implement these, you know, call it these training concepts. And then what happens is there's nobody to redirect them. So it's natural human behavior to go back to doing the things the way you used to do them. Because that's what you're used to, right? That's what you're comfortable with. Well, and that's kind of goes right back to the tactics versus strategy conversation too. And mm-hmm. the problem is this book is definitely not tactics, right? This book is a great strategy. Oh, absolutely. The problem is it's the way it's viewed in the marketplace, right? So too many of our listeners are viewing this and say, I'm going to take this, plug it in and tactically execute on this too. So they're not seeing right. the broader picture. So it's almost we have to reshape the thinking of our listeners for them to understand how to leverage this and how to apply it into their businesses. Right. Right. Why don't we take a quick break right now to let our viewers know about some new offerings from SBI. But stick around because when we come back, Andrew and I are gonna teach you another approach on how to leverage the concepts that are in this book. Do you have too many things to do and not enough time to do them? Is finding time to learn best practices almost impossible? The SBI podcast is your solution. Turn time spent exercising, commuting, and traveling into productive learning time with a subscription to the SBI Podcast. SBI Podcast listeners get unique insight into real-world sales and marketing issues through interviews with your industry peers every week. Find us on iTunes by searching for Sales Benchmark Index Podcast and subscribe today. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Drew Curran of SBI, and with me, my co-host, Andrew Urtiaga. Today, we're discussing a great book called The Challenger Customer, co-authored by Brent Adamson, Matthew Dixon, Pat Spencer, and Nick Tomain. So far, we've discussed some of the ways to implement the concept of the consensus purchasing dynamics and the downward pressure it is having on average deal size, win rates, and sales cycles. But let's shift gears for just a moment and talk about a different approach. Let's talk about a different approach here. And, and a way to look at this is to see that the changes in the buyer dynamics, right? This whole concept of the buying decision team. Right. I think when, if you read the book, you'll see that historically a seller will go to one buyer at a time individually and, and try to gain a, a series of yeses mm-hmm. from the buying decision team. What's wrong with that? Well, the problem with that is that everybody's diverse and and different, and you mentioned this earlier in the podcast. We all didn't grow up together. We all didn't go to the same schools. We all don't have the same work history. And so when we end up working in the same organization as functional leaders, and even in in the head of the organization, the CEO, we all have different lenses in which how we view a problem and how we want to solve that problem. And so what happens is that when we get together, right, right, we all have our own agenda, and our Makes own sense. objectives. So what happens is we can never agree 
on what the problem looks like, number one, and number two, how we go about solving the problem. So in order to move the needle, we end up agreeing to the lowest common de denominator. And I think this is really the essence of the book when we talk about downward pressure on the average deal size, the win rates, and the sales cycle. Right. Is the fact that your products end up being commoditized. And like we said earlier, it becomes a competitive slugfest. So the different approach, instead of training's not the answer, I think you and I both agree there. Right, we did. The different approach here is to look at how this impacts the overall strategy of the organization, right? Let me explain what this means. And it's in the, in the concept of strategic alignment, which is the linking of your internal strategies with the external marketplace. So what does this mean? Market research. Find out how my buyers have changed, right? Mm -hmm. Specifically, what are the markets that we want to play in? What are the accounts that we want to pursue that give us the greatest probability of success, right, in the shortest period of time? Who are the buyers and how they make a purchasing decision, which really the essence of this book? Who the users are, that's market research. That will define our corporate strategy, how we allocate people, money, and time. And then, then we can determine what are the products, what are the bullets in the gun that we want to arm our sales force with, right? That provide a competitive differentiation in the marketplace. Right. How do we create demand for that from a marketing strategy perspective? And then how do we convert that finally sales strategy into, right? How do we convert that demand into revenue? And who are the people that are gonna help us do that from a talent strategy perspective? That is the linking of the external market, which is really what this book is touching on, one right. component of it, the buyer segmentation, to the internal functional strategies of an organization. So really what I'm saying here, Drew, is long gone are the days of launching these indi individual initiatives. The only way to systematize revenue growth is through strategic alignment. And this is exactly what the top 9% of organizations are doing to leapfrog the competition. Right. Because too, many, too much effort is spent trying to, if you're trying to get up to best practices, the amount of time and effort that you get to best practices, they're going to move again, right? So it's kind of the Gretzky, skate to where the puck's going, not where the skate is. That's really the concept there. Correct. Right? But in order to kind of put that into context, you've got to be able to determine where you are, your organization, within strategic alignment, right? So you, you identified the links properly, too, but how do I know where we sit in? What's, the, what's my unit of measurement, too? Well, in order to do this, SBI has come up with a revenue growth maturity model. And for those of you that are following, following along at home, if you look at the annual research report and you flip to pages 11 through 16, you'll see specifically how it's outlined. So, Andrew, why don't you take us through this for just a second? Yeah, no problem. So our viewers, I know, can see the revenue growth maturity model. For those that are listening in, I'll walk you through the model. Uh, there's five levels in the growth maturity model, starting with level one, which is chaos. So how do I know that I'm in the chaos? By the way, we love that phrase, yeah, exactly. right? It's just like a bunch of people pulling their hair out. Everybody flying around. Fires. End of the month. End of the month. Yeah, this is a very reactive yeah. organization. And the way to define this and how you know you're in chaos is a corporate strategy may or may not exist. For sure, the functional strategies do not exist. Right. Right. So what you have is complete misalignment. The, the customers uh, don't understand what the brand is of the organization, what you're trying to accomplish. But more importantly, the metrics that you're looking for is a high customer acquisition cost, and then a low customer lifetime value. Right. And this is happening because you got a lot of customers churning. The second level is what we call defined. And in defined, now we have a corporate strategy that has been defined, given the name, and the functional strategies have also been defined, but they have not been implemented. Okay. Okay. In, in addition to that, how you know you're in the defined level is that they're also in... They've, the, the functional strategies that have been created are in isolation of each other. Right. So you still, the fact that you have a strategy helps, you're on the right path, but you still have a high customer acquisition cost and a lower customer lifetime right. value. And it's going through the motions, right? They're gonna do it in an annual planning exercise and then never look at it again with no interdependencies between the others. Absolutely, think shelfware, yep. collecting dust. And then from there we move into level three, which is implemented. So the difference here is, as the name states, is right. now you've got your corporate strategy, your functional strategies, they've actually been implemented. So you're starting to see some pockets of success. However, the difference here is that they're still not in alignment with one another. They've been created in silos. Right. So your customer acquisition cost decreases. There's a level of improvement there and your customer lifetime value increases compared to level Makes one. Sense. 
And level four, we call it managed. Now you're starting to see some incremental gains here. You have a corporate strategy that's been defined and implemented. The functional strategies have been defined and implemented. And more importantly here, the difference between level three and four is that they've been in internally aligned to one another. Right. Right. So you see, once again, the biggest decrease from level one from a customer acquisition cost and the biggest increase in customer lifetime value. And then finally, the last level, level five, is predictable. This is the holy grail of the revenue growth maturity model and where you want to be. It's a right. corporate strategy that's been defined, implemented. Functional strategies have been defined, implemented. They're internally aligned with one another. And the key here between level four and level five managed to predictable is the fact that they're aligned to the external market. And the gains here are uh, great compared to level one. So your customer acquisition cost has decreased by 30% and your customer lifetime value has increased by 26%. Right. Well, and that's why I love this book so much because it ties in perfectly too. So if you read the book and you start to, it talks about the difference in the changes in the buyer. What it's really telling you is like a level five company, we need to change and align our strategies with the external market, which is the prospects and the customers too. So it's absolutely fantastic in that. But one of the things that they also talked about a lot too was the difference in the number of purchasers that are involved, right? They called it the consensus buyer. Mm -hmm. And in the book, they reference three specific types they call it the go-getter, the skeptic, and the mobilizer, right? Mm -hmm. And they talked about how you get and relate to these particular people and how you get them on board, answer those concerns too. Mm -hmm. The other interesting statistic that was in there was they said that 5.4 people are generally involved now in a buying decision as compared to what it was previously. So if you're not looking at this in an overall strategic way, there's no way that you're going to be successful. And when you talk about misalignment, you know, in our research report this year, what we found is if you are strategically misaligned, mm -hmm. which almost 90% of the companies are too, you have a 4x higher percentage of missing your number this year. So that's why it's so important. It's critical. So why don't we do this? Why don't we take a quick break and stick around because when Drew and I get back, we're going to show you how to get strategically aligned. Making your number is hard. Your problems are complex. Complex problems need complex solutions. Introducing the SBI Magazine. Read in-depth stories written by award-winning journalists about how your peers have overcome their problems to make the numbers. When you need more than a tweet, social post, or blog article, turn to the SBI Magazine. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com to subscribe. Welcome back. I'm Drew Urtiaga of SBI, and with me is my co-host, Drew Karen. Today, we're discussing the Challenger customer, co-authored by Brent Addison, Matthew Dixon, Pat Spencer, and Nick Tillman. In the first segment, we've discussed some of the ways to implement the concept of the consensus purchase dynamics and the downward pressure it's having on the average deal size and win rates. We also discussed the pitfalls of using sales training as a plug and play to make a strategy. Now we're shifting to the concept of strategic alignment and how to weave the customer purchase dynamics into every function of the organization. Right, so if this resonates with you and you're wondering how do I know if I'm in strategic alignment or not too, let's break it down and we're gonna unpack that here for just a second. So we'll use the six step revenue growth methodology and the first step in that is market mm -hmm. research, right? And that's simply getting an understanding of the market, the accounts, the buyers and users and ensuring that we're differentiating ourselves from the competition. Agreed. Right. The market research, everything flows from market research, right? That has to be done first. The sequencing is very, very important, right? Once you have that done, you can move into the corporate strategy, right? The corporate strategy sets the tone for everything else, right? And that is really just a proper allocation of people, money, and time in the pursuit of profitable revenue. Mm -hmm. Once the corporate strategy is set, the next up is the product strategy. And product strategy we define as building and launching products, that service the needs of the market that the market's also willing to pay for, mm. okay? Next up is the marketing strategy. And when you look at that too, marketing strategy is simply about driving demand for the products and services that we sell as a company. Right. Sales strategy will come into play now, and sales strategy is taking that demand and converting it into revenue. 
And the final piece of the puzzle is the talent strategy, right? So we need to get the right people on board to execute the strategy perfectly. Gotcha. Right? And one of the things that was interesting, too, and there was a quote in the book um, that I love, and what he said was, he said, it isn't a sales methodology, referencing the Challenger book. It isn't a sales methodology. It's a commercial strategy. It affects what sales and marketing needs to do independently and also together. So when you're listening to that, that's what we talked about in the beginning of the segment, too, where too many people are taking this. It's not that the book isn't talking about the overall strategy. It's that people are narrowly taking it and coming back in. They're not breaking the mental model, which came from the book, too, and they're just trying to plug and play right. everything as a tactic or a strategy to try to fix things versus looking at a holistic approach. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just talking from experience, you saw this when they came out with the first book, which was The Challenger Seller right. or The Challenger Sale. And even in my prior life in the organization that I worked with, I remember we hired a lot of these guys to do the training and, and execute on this, right? And right. I remember nobody used it afterwards. It was right. great ideas, good intent. You come out of the training thinking, hey, this is going to be great. There is something that you mentioned that was great, though, um, that I think they really hit on. is this idea that, hey, sales and marketing need to be on the same page on how to leverage this, and it's more of a corporate strategy. Right. Um, that's a great point, and I think what you just walked us through, the six-step revenue methodology, we we think of it as expanding it even further. Right. We believe it touches product, corporate strategy, market research, and even your talent strategy, right? What are the type of people that can actually execute this? How do you corral, it's like herding kittens, how do you corral the 5.4 concept? All these buyers, who have different ways of looking at a problem, different ways of wanting to solve the problem, but then you gotta go sell these people, corral them, and then pull them all through the purchasing decision. At the same time, and by the way, when you interact with them, they're all at different stages right. of, where, of how they're thinking about the problem. Some might have investigated further on, some of them are not even thinking about it because it doesn't impact them, and here you are, you have to apply different approaches. So the talent piece, I think, is also critical in this. Well, it is, and um, when you look at that too, we've always said that talent is, you know, it's 50% of the equation. The other are the performance and conditions. And if you really look at the first sections of the strategy too, those are really setting the performance conditions. Right, yeah. so all of those market research, corporate strategy, you know, marketing, sales, product, they're all going in kind of setting the performance conditions and getting the talent right is hugely important because you're right, it's a complex sale these days. And in order to, and I love the phrase that was in the book too, breaking the mental model, right? Yeah. And really what that is, is shifting the way that we think about things. And from putting this book into application, one of the things I noticed the most is that Breaking the mental model, I don't think is as relevant for the customers as it is for the sales people and the sales leaders in there too, because I think we have to really reteach ourselves, break down the way we used to do things, recognize this is a new world, and there's certain ways that we need to approach this in order to be successful. And if you read the challenger customer, he lays it out perfectly, right? They yeah. tell you exactly how to do it. But once again, that has to fit in the overall strategy. Yeah, absolutely agree. So why don't we take one last commercial break, but stick around because when we come back, we'll wrap it up with some final thoughts. Each day, you receive hundreds of emails, tons of text messages, countless telephone calls, and sit in too many meetings. How do you find ideas to make the number with all this noise? The SBI blog filters all this nonsense for you and presents only first-rate ideas to make the number. Simplify your life. Subscribe to one blog and read the best content. Go to salesbenchmarkindex.com and subscribe today. Welcome back. I'm Andrew Ortiaga and with my co-host Drew Karen. Drew, before we give this book a spinning back kick, by the way, that's four spinning back kicks because there's four authors to the right. book. Tell the audience where we can find more information in regards to the topic of strategic alignment. Sure. So if you are listening or watching and wondering where your organization is with regards to strategic alignment and where you rank on the revenue growth model, you should download the 2016 research report and read pages 28 through 33 and then fill them out with the other functional leaders. Okay, Drew, so for the big question, is this book a pretender or a contender? Uh, contender, huge contender when you leverage it appropriately. No, I absolutely agree. 
right? The book's definitely a contender. There's no spinning back kick needed, right? <laughs> Excellent material that hits at the heart of the ma matter with market research. But what does this mean to you, the audience? It means you can't make your number if you don't have strategic alignment across the organization. This is why you care. If you feel you may not be in strategic alignment, you can have one of our experts lead you through a workshop which will detail how to do this. Simply go to salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash 2016 dash workshop and request it, right? Andrew, thanks for going the rounds with me today. I hope our audience enjoyed it. No problem. I stretched, but I didn't have to kick anybody today. Maybe you once we <laughs> leave, but. I think today was a good episode, right? <laughs> so I also want to thank you, our audience, for tuning in. This show has become very popular, and it's you, our audience, that makes all of this possible. So until the next time, we wish you much success as you try to make your number. This has been the SBI Podcast. For more information on SBI services, case studies, the SBI team and how we work, or to subscribe to our other offerings, please visit us at salesbenchmarkindex.com.